Chapter 3 So, at least, it appeared at the time, but there was something in the tale of this suburban park that remained with Arnold and beset him, and sent him at last to the remote north of the story, for, as he was meditating on this vague attraction, he chanced to light on a shabby brown book on his untidy shelves, a book gathered from a stall in Farringdon Street, where the manuscript of Traherne's Centuries of Meditations had been found. So far, Arnold had scarcely glanced at it. It was called A London Walk, Meditations in the Streets of the Metropolis. The author was the Reverend Thomas Hampole, and the book was dated 1853. It consisted, for the most part, of moral and obvious reflections, such as might be expected from a pious and amiable clergyman of the day. In the middle of the 19th century, the relish of moralizing, which flourished so in the age of Addison and Pope and Johnson, which made The Rambler a popular book, and gave fortunes to the publishers of sermons, had still a great deal of vigor. People liked to be warned of the consequences of their actions, to have lessons in punctuality, to learn about the importance of little things, to hear sermons from stones, and to be taught that there were gloomy reflections to be drawn from almost everything. So then, the Reverend Thomas Hampel stalked the London streets with a moral and monitory glance in his eye, saw Regent Street in its early splendor and thought of the ruins of mighty Rome, preached on the text of solitude in a multitude as he viewed what he called the teeming myriads, and allowed a desolate, half-ruinous house in Chancery to suggest thoughts of the happy Christmas parties that had once thoughtlessly reveled behind the crumbling walls and broken windows. But here and there, Mr. Hampole became less obvious, and perhaps more really profitable. For example, there is a passage, it has already been quoted, I think, by some modern author, which seems curious enough. Has it ever been your fortune, courteous reader, Mr. Hampole inquired, to rise in the earliest dawning of a summer day, ere yet the radiant beams of the sun have done more than touch with light the domes and spires of the great city? If this has been your lot, have you not observed that magic powers have apparently been at work? The accustomed scene has lost its familiar appearance. The houses which you have passed daily, it may be for years, as you have issued forth on your business or on your pleasure, now seem as if you beheld them for the first time. They have suffered a mysterious change, into something rich and strange. Though they may have been designed with no extraordinary exertion of the art of architecture, yet you have been ready to admit that they now stand in glory, shine like stars, apparelled in a light serene. They have become magical habitations, supernal dwellings, more desirable to the eye than the fabled pleasure dome of the eastern potentate, or the bejeweled hall built by the genie for Aladdin in the Arabian tale. A good deal in this vein, and then, when one expected the obvious warning against putting trust in appearances, both transitory and delisory, there came a very odd passage. Some have declared that it lies within our own choice to gaze continually upon a world of equal or even greater wonder and beauty. It is said by these that the experiments of the alchemists of the Dark Ages are, in fact, related not to the transmutation of metals, but to the transmutation of the entire universe. This method, or art, or science, or whatever we choose to call it, supposing it to exist, or to have ever existed, is simply concerned to restore the delights of the primal paradise, to enable men, if they will, to inhabit a world of joy and splendor. It is perhaps possible that there is such an experiment, and that there are some who have made it. The reader was referred to a note, one of several, at the end of the volume, and Arnold, Already a good deal interested by this unexpected vein in the Reverend Thomas, looked it up, and thus it ran. I am aware that these speculations may strike the reader as both singular and, I may perhaps add, chimerical, and indeed 
I may have been somewhat rash and ill-advised in committing them to the printed page. If I have done wrong, I hope for pardon. And indeed, I am far from advising anyone who may read these lines to engage in the doubtful and difficult experiment which they adumbrate. Still, we are bidden to be seekers of the truth. Veritas contra mundum. I am strengthened in my belief that there is at least some foundation for the strange theories at which I have hinted, by an experience that befell me in the early days of my ministry. Soon after the termination of my first curacy, and after I had been admitted to priest's orders, I spent some months in London living with relations in Kensington. A college friend of mine, whom I will call the Reverend Mr. S., was, I was aware, a curate in a suburb of the north of London, S.N. I wrote to him, and afterwards called at his lodgings, at his invitation. I found S. in a state of some perturbation. He was threatened, it seemed, with an affection of the lungs, and his medical adviser was insistent that he should leave London for a while, and spend the four months of the winter in the more genial climate of Devonshire. Unless this were done, the doctor declared, the consequences to my friend's health might be of a very serious kind. S. was very willing to act on this advice, and indeed anxious to do so. But, on the other hand, he did not wish to resign his curacy, in which, as he said, he was both happy and, he trusted, useful. On hearing this, I at once proffered my services, telling him that if the vicar approved, I should be happy to do his duty till the end of the ensuing march, or even later, if the physicians considered a longer stay in the south would be advisable. S. was overjoyed. He took me at once to see the vicar, the fitting inquiries were made, and I entered on my temporary duties in the course of a fortnight. It was during this brief ministry in the environs of London that I became acquainted with a very singular person whom I shall call Glanville. He was a regular attendant at our services, and, in the course of my duty, I called on him and expressed my gratification at his evident attachment to the liturgy of the Church of England. He replied with due politeness and asked me to sit down and partake with him of the soothing cup, and we soon found ourselves engaged in conversation. I discovered early in our association that he was conversant with the reveries of the German theosophist Bayman, and the later works of his English disciple William Law, and it was clear to me that he looked on these labyrinths of mystical theology with a friendly eye. He was a middle-aged man, spare of habit and of a dark complexion and his face was illuminated in a very impressive manner as he discussed the speculations which had evidently occupied his thoughts for many years. Based as these theories were on the doctrines, if we may call them by that name, of Law and Bayman, they struck me as of an extremely fantastic, I would even say fabulous, nature. But I confess that I listened with a considerable degree of interest, while making it evident that as a minister of the Church of England, I was far from giving my free assent to the propositions that were placed before me. They were not, it is true, manifestly and certainly opposed to orthodox belief, but they were assuredly strange, and as such to be received with salutary caution. As an example of the ideas which beset a mind which was ingenious, and I may say devout, I may mention that Mr. Glanville often dwelt on a consequence, not generally acknowledged, of the fall of man. When man yielded, he would say, to the mysterious temptation intimated by the figurative language of holy writ, the universe, originally fluid and the servant of his spirit, became solid, and crashed down upon him, overwhelming him beneath its weight and its dead mass. I requested him to furnish me with more light on this remarkable belief and I found that in his opinion, that which we now regard as stubborn matter was, primarily, to use his singular phraseology, the heavenly chaos, a soft and ductile substance, which could be molded by the imagination of uncorrupted men into whatever forms he chose it to assume. Strange as it may seem, he added, the wild inventions, as we consider them, of the Arabian tales, give us some notion of the powers of the homo protoplastus. 
The prosperous city became a lake. The carpet transports us in an instant of time, or rather, without time, from one end of the earth to another. The palace rises at a word from nothingness. Magic, we call all this, while we deride the possibility of any such feats. But this magic of the East is but a confused and fragmentary recollection of operations which were of the first nature of man, and of the fiat which was then entrusted to him. I listened to this and other similar expositions of Mr. Glanville's extraordinary beliefs with some interest, as I have remarked. I could not but feel that such opinions were, in many respects, more in accordance with the doctrine I had undertaken to expound than much of the teaching of the philosophers of the day, who seemed to exalt rationalism at the expense of reason, as that divine faculty was exhibited by Coleridge. Still, when I assented, I made it clear to Glanville that my assent was qualified by my firm adherence to the principles which I had solemnly professed at my ordination. The months went by in the peaceful performance of the pastoral duties of my office. Early in March, I received a letter from my friend Mr. S., who informed me that he had greatly benefited by the heir of Torquay, and that his medical adviser had assured him that he need no longer hesitate to resume his duties in London. Consequently, S. proposed to return at once, and, after warmly expressed thanks for my extreme kindness, as he called it, he announced he wished to perform his part in the church services on the following Sunday. Accordingly, I paid my final visits to those of the parishioners with whom I had more particularly associated, reserving my call on Mr. Glanville for the last day of my residence at S.N. He was sorry, I think, to hear of my impending departure, and told me that he would always recollect our conversational exchanges with much pleasure. I, too, am leaving S.N., he added. Early next week, I sail for the East, where my stay may be prolonged for a considerable period. After mutual expressions of polite regret, I rose from my chair and was about to make my farewells when I observed that Glanville was gazing at me with a fixed and singular regard. One moment, he said, beckoning me to the window where he was standing. I want to show you the view. I don't think you have seen it. The suggestion struck me as peculiar, to say the least of it. I was, of course, familiar with the street in which Glanville resided, as with most of the S.N. streets, and he, on his side, must have been well aware that no prospect that his window might command could show me anything that I had not seen many times during my four months' stay in the parish. In addition to this, the streets of our London suburbs do not often offer a spectacle to engage the amateur of landscape and the picturesque. I was hesitating, hardly knowing whether to comply with Glanville's request or to treat it as a piece of pleasantry, when it struck me that it was possible that his first floor window might afford a distant view of St. Paul's Cathedral. I accordingly stepped to his side and waited for him to indicate the scene which he, presumably, wished me to admire. His features still wore the odd expression which I have already remarked. Now, said he, look out and tell me what you see. Still bewildered, I looked through the window and saw exactly that which I had expected to see, a row or terrace of neatly designed residences, separated from the highway by a parterre or a miniature park, adorned with trees and shrubs. A road, passing to the right of the terrace, gave a view of the streets and crescents of more recent construction, and of some degree of elegance. Still in the whole of the familiar spectacle, I saw nothing to warrant any particular attention, and in a more or less jocular manner I said as much to Glanville. By way of reply, he touched me lightly with his fingertips on the shoulder, and said, Look again. I did so. For a moment, my heart stood still and I gasped for breath. Before me, in place of the familiar structures, there was disclosed a panorama of unearthly and astounding beauty, in deep dells, bowered by overhanging trees. There blossomed flowers, such as only dreams can show, such deep purples that yet seemed to glow like precious stones with a hidden but ever-present radiance, roses whose hues outshone any that are to be seen in our gardens, 
tall lilies alive with light, and blossoms that were as beating gold. I saw well-shaded walks that went down to green hollows bordered with thyme, and here and there the grassy eminence above, and the bubbling well below, were crowned with architecture of fantastic and unaccustomed beauty, which seemed to speak of fairyland itself. I might almost say that my soul was ravished by the spectacle displayed before me. I was possessed by a degree of rapture and delight such as I had never experienced. A sense of beatitude pervaded my whole being. My bliss was such as cannot be expressed by words. I uttered an inarticulate cry of joy and wonder. And then, under the influence of a swift revulsion of terror, which even now I cannot explain, I turned and rushed from the room and from the house without one word of comment or farewell to the extraordinary man who had done I knew not what. In great perturbation and confusion of mind, I made my way into the street. Needless to say, no trace of the phantasmagoria that had been displayed before me remained. The familiar street had resumed its usual aspect. The terrace stood as I had always seen it, and the newer buildings beyond, where I had seen, oh, what dells of delight, what blossoms of glory, stood as before in their neat, though unostentatious, order. Where I had seen valleys embowered in green leafage, waving gently in the sunshine and the summer breeze, there were now boughs bare and black, scarce showing so much as a single bud. As I have mentioned, the season was early in March, and a black frost, which had set in ten days or a fortnight before, still constrained the earth and its vegetation. I walked hurriedly away to my lodgings, which were some distance from the abode of Glanville. I was sincerely glad to think that I was leaving the neighborhood on the following day. I may say that up to the present moment I have never revisited S. N. Some months later I encountered my friend Mr. S., and under cover of asking about the affairs of the parish in which he still ministered, I inquired after Glanville, with whom, I said, I had made acquaintance. It seemed he had fulfilled his intention of leaving the neighborhood within a few days of my own departure. He had not confided his destination or his plans for the future to anyone in the parish. My acquaintance with him, said S., was of the slightest, and I do not think that he made any friends in the locality, though he had resided in S. N. for more than five years. It is now some fifteen years since this most strange experience befell me and during that period I have heard nothing of Glanville, whether he is still alive in the distant Orient, or whether he is dead. I am completely ignorant.'